steps and advice for the next iteration of the at-large user's voice in the name of the at-large advisory committee. Just work around me. We're also going to look at an exploration of engaging true and representative diversity, which encompasses not just accessibility and enabling tools, very important parts of the process, I admit, but also how we bring in gender, culture and language diversity in the global context of a multi-stakeholder input model for interactive and display tools. I'd like to give you, and it would be so much nicer if you were able to see um, the slides, but you're not, so just work with me with your visual experience and imagination, a little bit about the ALAC background. And seeing as they've set up my computer now to such a small size, I can't read the slide in front of me. You'll have to forgive me if I stand back and try and squint. The At-Large Advisory Committee, or ALAC, is responsible for considering and providing advice on the specific activities. Go ahead. ALAC is responsible, thank you very much, I think we're on a roll, is responsible for considering and providing advice on specific activities of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, as they relate to the interests of individual internet users, the at-large community. It was established as an interim ALAC only on the 31st of October 2002 and became established in its current form on June 29th, 2007. And as I mentioned earlier, we are currently going under our first independent review. ALAC relies on the broader at-large community, including regional at-large structures, RALOs, and the at-large organisations, ALSs, to involve and represent into ICANN policy developments a broad set of individual internet users' interests. And it is those people representing the regional at-large organisations and at-large structures, when I stop filibusting, that will be our panel and in discussions today. Underpinning the ALAC is a network of self-organised, self-supporting at-large structures throughout the world which involve internet individual users at a local issue level. The at-large structures, are, or ALSs, are either existing organisations, such as not-for-profits, or in many cases, about one-third of our total number, ISOC chapters, or they may be newly formed for the purpose. Currently, we have more than 116 accredited ALSs, and we're experiencing a growth phase with up to 120 expected to be accredited before the end of the year and another five before March 2009. The short-term planning view of several of the regional at-large organisations is to have a minimum of one at-large structure per country. ALSs are organised into five regional at-large organisations, one for the, each of the geographic regions within ICANN, something that in itself is under current review. These regions are Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, and North America. The RALOs manage the outreach and public involvement and are the main forum and coordination point in each region for public input into ICANN matters. And it is from the Africa and Asia Pacific region that we'll be hearing from today. If at any stage anyone wants to look, because we are open, transparent and wish to have everything living in a goldfish bowl, at what stage any application is for a development to be accredited as an ALS and to do a drill down to see what types of organisations are being involved in bringing the internet user voice to the table at ICANN, this URL, and I'm assuming that these presentations will be made uh, public on the website later, will take you to the current state of any application processes. Our panellists, which I'm delighted to introduce today, are... Sorry, Howard. Second name, Dewey. Dewey. Your second name? 
Dakiti. Hawa Dakiti, who I've hijacked from the floor to uh, represent Afralo. Um, the presentation has been prepared by Fatimata, um, but Hawa has served with me for the last 12 months on the at-large advisory committee executive, and I wasn't going to let her sit in the audience when she can come here and do the presentation. We also have uh, our very newest representative from Asia Pacific, uh, Dr. Vivekanadan. He is the IP chair professor and head set and head of the Centre for IP Law Studies and Director of the Nalsa Proximate Education University of Law here in Hyderabad. And Mr Shiva Muthasama, who is the President of ISOC India Chennai, one of our newest at-large structures and CEO at Turiya. I'm now going to attempt to stop this and start the slide show that Hauer and I are going to present. And we're going to present it by way of an example of one of the challenges. And one of the challenges, one of the limitations, and one of the costly exercises that in our recent experience of bringing the user voice to internet governance, we are very aware of, is the language diversity. Very important sessions on multilingualism are going on in parallel with this session now. But what we have is an African representative who is not comfortable working in English, and an Australian representative who barely manages the English language at all who are going to do somebody else's presentation the best way we can to share with you. So, how if you care to join me while I bring up... ..the African view. Please. And perhaps we can welcome Howard because she's quite nervous about being up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. I'm Hawa from Mali, West Africa, and I like member things uh, two years ago. So I will present uh, this presentation uh, for Fatimata C, who can be uh, arrive uh, for the IGF meeting for the family reason. So I'm sorry, that is a. Uh, how say uh, uh, my chair? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I railroaded her into it. Is what she's Our saying. Our big challenge is that the uh, end user is the multi language uh, coalition. So we need to have all the end user as uh, no difference with language the end user are speaking. So why? Uh, why should African use and end users shout about in EGF? They should EGF feel free their basic needs. Access, that's our big challenge. Development opportunities, participation, and security. Because, uh, you know, uh, we have a big problem of security in Africa network. And if I may, I'll use my parade ground voice and not come too close to the microphone. Wave frantically at me if you need me to yell little any louder. Why should Africa end users care about IGF? Would IGF fulfil their basic needs, is the question being asked, in terms of access, development opportunities, participation, and of course, network security? The African end user must participate because there are no better their need and concern. We some know what we, what we need, but we don't stay and someone uh, give us what we can do, not. We, we need to, uh, to, have our, to have and define our need and give some solution for African. Have value to share with others. That's an African job. Can learn from others can create participation for mutual development. The African end user must participate because they know better their needs and concerns. They have values to share with others, they can learn from others, and they can create partnerships for mutual development. And at this point, one of the reasons I'm going to stop and do a sidebar is to say the provision of real-time interpretation to get beyond the barrier of a native French speaker communicating with a not terribly good English speaker 
should be an example that everyone in this room will be taking home. Part of what's happened within the ICANN model of multi-stakeholder interaction is that at most of, and in fact all, of the meetings that the at-large advisory committee and the regional at-large organisations and the ALSs have, be they the telephonic monthly meetings or our face-to-face -face meetings within an ICANN meeting are supported by pre-translation of documentation into the UN languages and most importantly have real-time interpretation of what is being said. Might I share with you that being someone who speaks English with a particular type of accent makes it very difficult for other native English speakers to even understand what we Australians say from time to time. So we do need, looking at uh, one of the suggestions from the book on internet governance that's in each of our satchels, to actually try and build that Tower of Babel. So when Hauer was concerned that she would be comfortable speaking French and that we do not have interpretation facilities here, I said, no, let's use this as an example of one of the things I can is getting right. Yes, we can. How to participate African group? Understanding the uses via capacity building at local level, networking, use of legal languages, contributing via physical attendees, remote participation via community media and internet. How to participate? Understanding the African specific issues via capacity building at local level, networking, and I don't just mean the ISP networking that Hauer and her company do, but the human networking that's going on at these meetings and at similar venues. The use of local languages, and that is vital and something that when we are looking at our discussion in a few moments, I hope, will be picked up on. And to contribute via physical attendance at such meetings and remote participation via community media and the internet. And that is one of the lessons learned from the ICANN experience involving the user voice. We have not got remote participation right yet. That is a work in progress. And for an Asia Pacific and indeed African perspective, these are enormous challenges. It is costly, not just in terms of airfares and support to get the volunteer community, which are the end users, to these meetings, it actually means that major microeconomic effects are happening within their countries. The places they are leaving are suffering. You have an ISP that's running on half a tank of fuel because Howard's standing next to me at an IGF meeting. And it is that management of volunteers, it is that best practice development that I believe Fatimata and Howard are saying the IGF multi-stakeholder model still needs to work on. Certainly from the perspective of the ICANN model, they are trying, but one of the lessons learned is it is horrendously costly and it is very time consuming. Lesson learned within ALAC. What is being well done? Networking, recruitment of ILSs, Afralo will represent among uh, the five regions, around 20% of. Mm. Uh, information sharing, including provision of translation during the meeting, capacity building for ILS representative, information training on ongoing internet uses. Lessons learned within ALAC. What is being well done? Networking, recruitment of ALSs within AFRALO, and it's exciting to hear that of the five regions, AFRALO's ALSs do measure now a little more than 20% because we've just had another application from an African um, internet user organisation. It provides information sharing, including the provision of translations during meetings, and real-time simultaneous translations during our monthly telephone calls. So as chair of the at-large advisory committee, on my monthly calls, how I hears what the English channel is saying via a French interpreter, and the same happens in Spanish. 
that in itself is a cost and management impost. But if you're going to get it right, it's worthwhile to pursue. And capacity building for ALS at large structures representatives. Information and training on ongoing internet issues. Many of our at large structures from all of the regional at large organisations come with a certain degree of technical background, of reason for being here. We'll hear shortly um, from one that is a ISOC chapter. So it brings to its particular Asia Pacific region a certain amount of technical expertise which allows the region to tap into that asset to make plain English copy of information we need to share to the end user public. And the same can be said in Africa. It's very important that simple language, simple terms, not just linguistic translations are going on. Uh, what need to do to be done? Promote capacity building on internet related issues that the local level Pro recommended the inclusion of internet governance in official training program in conjunction with GAC. GAC is a government advisor committee. Uh, support the organization of IGF at, level lo at local level for better participation of the end users. Continuing on the lessons learned within the ALAC, what still needs to be done from the AFRALO perspective, but I'll hasten to say from the perspective of each of the five regional at large organisations. We need to promote capacity building on internet related issues at the local level. This is something that Asia Pacific has an interest in just as much as Africa. We need to recommend the inclusion of internet governance in official training programs in conjunction with the government advisory committee. And we need to support the organisation of IGF meetings at local level for better participation of end users. And what the at-large at movement and the at-large advisor committee has done in its experiment, and we're now getting a lot of feedback from those mics, in its experiment with at-large and how we are built has brought the grassroots level in. This is not information by proxy. This is actual information and comment from the real end user. Yes. Will be continue what need to be done. Involve the end users Go ahead. in the preparation of organization of IGF. Promote the creating of networking group per IGF team for better for the better participation. Participate in the IGF evolution to measure the impact of African engagement. These are matters that AFRALO believe the experiment that is internet end user voice within the ICANN limited remit has to pass on to a larger, more broadly based set of interests that we'll find in internet governance forum. What still needs to be done? We need to involve the end users, ALSs, in the preparation and organisation of internet governance forums. We need to promote the creation of working groups per IGF theme for better participation. And we need to participate in the IGF evaluation to measure the impact of African engagement. And if I can come back to Fatimata and Howard's second point, I have made very clear over several years is that when we have the tyranny of time zones and language diversity, to keep to a single topic or limited number of topics for discussion is the only way that the energy put in can match the desired outcome. We actually need to do more calls on smaller numbers of topics rather than bigger meetings. So, thank you very much. I just want to say that, that uh, not speaking English is not more important for the community and users. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry if you don't understand what you say, but I try to speak English and try to that you comp what to say to compensate. Yeah, to compensate that all users need to have her voice in our community.
Thank you very much. And I hope the um, unplanned example of the challenges in a multilingual area of communication even between like-minded internet end users is something that everyone in this audience will take home and consider what collaborative tools, what technical issues such as migration from V4 to V6 that may make those tools more effective. How are we, when we get the next billion users online, going to manage greater complexity, not less? Thank you so much, Howie. I really appreciate it. Thank you, my dear. I'm now uh, going to introduce our, oops, can I just leave this here? That's not a problem. Um, our, our most uh, welcome and new counterpart to myself in the Asia Pacific Regional at Large organisation. It is my absolute honour um, to welcome uh, Vivek in your first official capacity, correct, for, for this organisation. Um, the way that a ALAC, the At Large Advisory Committee, is built is that each of the five regions elects two representatives to go into the ALAC and then a third nominating committee appointee from that region makes up the three. So a 15-member at-large advisory committee is regionally balanced, and what we have on the stage here is the one-year-old and exhausted representative and the brand-new energetic uh, person who's going to really move uh, the subcontinent and its views ahead in the world at large. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. I am Professor Vivek Anandan. I teach in the National Academy of Legal Studies and Research University, which is based in Hyderabad. And uh, I've been specializing or wearing two hats in terms of legal teaching. One is intellectual property rights. Another one is cyber laws, or people differently call it as information technology and law or internet and law in various forms, but cyber law seems to be very catchy. And so that is the name which normally courses are conducted. And my foray into this field started in 1998 when I introduced a seminar course for the final year law students on e-governance. And at that time, uh, there was no law formally in India. It was in 2000. Indian government enacted the Information Technology Act 2000. Prior to that, there was no regulatory or legal thing. At the time, we started talking about the experiments, what's happening in other developed parts of the world, and what lessons could be learned in terms of uh, developing countries where, uh, you know, leave alone internet, normal literacy itself is a big issue. So. We were, at the time when we were developing certain models of research and what we are doing, we were confronted with the new concept that the world has been confronting in the physical world what you call as haves and have-nots was the major issue. And then we thought with internet there is going to be a new term called the no's and the no-nots. And the no's are the one who are in the internet world. And we talked about the predominant English as the forum. And then the no-nots are the one who are going to be burdened along with have-nots in terms of the physical world. And they are going to be incapacitated by not being part of this uh, new revolution which was happening. So in fact, uh, very interestingly for you, uh, for Cheryl, as well as some of the uh, audience here who might have come from outside India, you wouldn't believe in the early 90s with the introduction of computers and internet, there was massive resistance. There was massive resistance among blue collars workers and even white collar workers. India witnessed one of the massive bank strike by bank employees in the early 90s, opposing the introduction of computers, opposing the introduction of online, because the notion was it's going to take away jobs. It is going to remove jobs, a country which you know that the clock is ticking, 1.23 billion population and still increasing. They felt that 
this is going to really remove jobs, so we are quite opposed to this technology. And so that was the kind of thing. I remember, uh, some of the Indian audience here may know, a famous uh, Supreme Court judge who was well respected called uh, Justice Krishna Iyer, who was a Supreme Court judge who was instrumental in, in a lot of major decisions, spearheaded that strike of the bank employees. And I have to confess, in 91, I was a young lecturer. I was quite enamored by the concept of that strike. I even supported it at the time. And then time has changed. After 10 years, around 2001, same Justice Krishnayar came to our university for some work. And he's octogenarian. He's uh, you know, close to 90 now. And about eight, nine years back when he came, and when I wanted some material, he called his secretary and said, can you check it up in the laptop, uh, whether the whole material is there. So I reminded him of the strike in 1991. And uh, Justice Krishnayar uh, was uh, quite honest enough to confess that we do some mistakes in life. And it is a huge mistake, he said that at the time, opposing this technology. So the question is, the issue of knows and know not still remains. But the question is that the opposition to internet is no more there. So the question of uh, internet is today is the question of affordability, the question of reaching out to the people. It is never the question of should it be there, which was there in the early 90s in Indian context. And very interestingly, I would say that India produces the largest number of information technologists in the world. And it also produces the largest number of lawyers in the world. So that's a very interesting facet. So that is one of the things what we are linked. And I often tell, among all the professionals, a lawyer is the one who is the biggest information processor. And the traditional lawyer, if a client has to approach, his room should be filled up with books, and lots and lots of books, whether he has read it or not, whether he owns it or not. So they normally have second-hand books filled up in the room because the client is assured, reassured, this lawyer has read a lot of things and is going to take care of my interest. But that's changing where you can sit with a small you know, laptop with all the you know, legal softwares inside. I think the traditional mindset of a client is still a problem. Still, I ask some of my lawyer friends who extensively use internet and softwares, they still say that we still keep these books because the client is not still understanding that all the things are there in the laptop. So this is the situation where we are finding law and technology uh, as an interface. So my selection into ALAC, which uh, she wanted me to share my experience, uh, I stood for election first time in my life, I would say that, because I'm quite scared of election. I, I always, uh, you know, what you call it, applied and got a job or whatever it is. So I thought uh, I stood an election for uh, this from the Asia Pacific region. And to my surprise that, you know, I was elected and probably that kindles a lot of flames that still I'm le left with little more years in life, maybe stand for further elections in a bigger way, right, in life apart from ALAC. So my proposition when uh, Alak, when I joined, as well as Cheryl, who is spearheading, then um, who quite grilled me about you know, what I'm planning to do uh, as part of the Asia Pacific, is that uh, I have my commitments as a professor and my classes, et cetera, but, and then I want to be focused. One is that I said that I would like to be an intermediate between uh, the user groups, Alak, as well as the policy makers. When I say that I'm an intermediate, not that uh, in Indian experience, the policy makers uh, think uh, academics in a very high regard. It's not so in other countries. But still, there's a very changing facet happening that if uh, academics are quite serious about bringing in inputs from down, and there is a space now where you can interact with the policy makers. So the whole question comes about the public policy issue in terms of internet. Uh, as you all know that internet was, I was mentioning, internet is the first true spirit which came, and a censorship of anything on the internet is an aberration. That is the kind of understanding when internet as a free spirit came in. And I even used to mention in the class that Karl Marx, uh, who did uh, you know, his communist theory, said that a famous statement, the state will wither away. The states, a state will wither away, according to him, when communism comes. A state has not withered away in the real world, but state has withered away in the internet world. So there is, it's a borderless world, what we, we really think. So it came in a virtual reality of you know, such kind of dream. But again, the problem, I often say that being a law professor, even Cheryl used to be you know, a little teasing me that uh, you lawyers come in, and then you have your jargons, and your clichés, and then you're putting in things. I, but I want to objectively look, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a law professor. So I really don't have any client to argue. right? So we have ethics we teach a lot. And the law students who come out you know, form their own ethics when they start practicing. So always, we are so different from the lawyers, what we produce, and then what we do in classroom. So we, I often said that 
it, the larger research is that when you really look at public policy, there's this uneasy relationship between law and internet usage. Because, as I said, if I simplify law, I always tell law is a product. It's a byproduct of a particular time and a space. If you draw a graph of time and space, the law comes in. So there is a law of the land. So it upholds sovereignty and it upholds you know, certain ethos and values. And then it has to confront on the other side of a free world, what you call as internet, and which is connected by what you call netizens instead of citizens. So you really have, how does law interface with technology has been a big issue. So the whole question in front when the entire cyber jurisprudence started was whether to have a legislation or not. That is the very first question. To legislate or not to legislate was the big, you know, catch-22 situation of internet usage. And true internet-spirited people said, you need not, you know, you should not legislate. Or rather, don't mess up with that by legislations. Because legislations have brought a lot of mess up. Many of my friends in India will know that, that every time India had a sunrise industry, let us say granite, let us say aquaculture, there used to be a ministry in the government. And then obviously, the sunrise industry had a sunset. But information technology did not have a ministry for a very long time. And many people attributed India's success in information technology because there is no ministry to regulate. This was a, what you call as an extreme view. But on the other side, they always felt that this law and uh, you know, internet is still try trying to come to terms. Uh, means you know, how far the law in its jurisprudence, which has been handling you know, physical world, how does it really have to operate and how far it can go, how far it can regulate, or will there be a, reg uh, uh, no, uh, is there a demand to regulate? These issues have been again and again you know, discussed in various you know, policy forums. So how far you can go? So one important part is that law takes two views about this. One is a regulation, which they consider that uh, any technology is value neutral, and it is the people who use this value neutral technologies decide what to do these things. And so they feel that internet is a value neutral technology. It can be used for greater things. But at the same time, there's a big potential of internet also can be manipulated. Internet can also fall into the hands of the operator who does. So this dilemma has brought, uh, was reflected in the Information Technology Act, which was brought in the country in 2000, which first enabled e-commerce. So they brought in recognition of digital signature, all that stuff. That was one of the important thing of the act. The second of the act was to enable e-governance. <coughs> it has said that government should utilize or exploit internet to the biggest way for development purpose. That was the second part. So e-commerce, development. And third part, they did bring in provisions, what you call a cyber security or cyber crimes. And so these are the three parts. If I take stock in eight years, what has happened? from an Indian context, which is part of the Asia-Pacific context. After all, I said India and China roughly forms you know, two-fifths of the world population, roughly speaking. This, so you said that the next one billion has to come from India and China put together. That's the users who have to grow, because the users have grown up in other spaces. So if I really look at the eight years talk, digital signature and e-commerce, this particular act has enabled e-commerce in a big way. It means you know we are able to do. E-governance. I would say, as a very modest start, state of Andhra Pradesh has used e-governance to the hilt. State of Karnataka has used. Some of the southern states who have been uh, somewhere historically advantaged being ahead of internet uh, usage have effectively used. But if you look at the rest of many parts of the India, e-governance is a non-starter in spite of a statutory you know, provision, in, in spite of a statutory you know, push to that, e-governance has been a non-starter. And if I look at the field of law, you will not know which case is coming into the court till the morning you reach the court. Except for Bangalore, which used to publish cost list of the day. People have to really go to the court and find the judge hasn't come or the case has been postponed. And you can see the enormity of many, many ordinary people who travel long ways to court to really find that the case is not listed today, which could have been done. So a lot of things were spoken in the early 2000 that there are going to be internet kiosks, there are going to be a lot of things which came. 
But somewhere down the line, probably there is no proper business model. This did not come up. But the onus still lies with the government in order to exploit this. So there's nothing to be, means you, know, that you cannot stop with the pride that India is in the forefront of information technology and then every third Indian who is traveling abroad is an expert on information technology. But back home when you come down, the usage part of it is, cannot be pushed. And the usage of individuals in this country is going to come, in my opinion, only through government help and government aid. It has to really push to that stage, and then individuals know what to do about it. So the initial push has to come to the government. And there is also a notion about uh, internet and uh, information technology, which is now waning, but earlier, they considered that this is an elite, elite person's game. It is not the common man. People asked, will internet give you water? Will internet give you food? Was an important question. Internet certainly will not give you food and water, but internet can manage water resources. Internet can really plan about you know, food resources, etc. That is where how we effectively use. And the second point, people do ask uh, <coughs> what, you, what I call the Western model, what they call the stove pipe theory, they call it, that every home has a gas pipe. So uh, how much, how many computers uh, are owned? Or like per, cap, you know, per family car, how many computers per family is the question. Uh, my proposition is that, that is that kind of model will never work. There is another model called the community model. <coughs> there is a community development model. For example, I used to tell that in a village, there is a pond. And there are 100 villagers who take a dip in the pond, and still they are clean. And I'm not going to give each villager a bathroom. But still, our, prop, our issue is not owning a bathroom. Our issue is to be clean. Our issue is to have a bath. So it's very simple that we need to look at development models in terms of internet usage, in terms of penetration, where people can share and pull things. So if I'm in abroad, I don't have own a phone, it's going to be difficult for me to call. But I do have a STD booth here, which serves you know, so many streets, or two, three streets, who can make a call at any time they want. So still we communicate through different development models. Telecommunications brought this model. So, but uh, as much telecommunications brought STD kiosks, et cetera, internet models have not still evolved. Internet models still not evolved. To give an example, I went to the passport office a few days back. The passport office allows you to use internet to download the form, register online for a particular time to have your interview. But if I looked at it, there are very hardly few people who are in that line. But on the other side of the line, when pe people physically stand and take a token, there's a huge crowd, which simply shows that there is internet. It is available in internet. But the question is probably users don't have access. And then second part is that, you know, uh, the question is, I uh, mean, how do you really work out these models? So these are some of the issues uh, which we have been working, we have been researching. So one of the points, what I thought was as being a LAC member, that uh, my role is uh, from academic setting, but which means I, I do have an access from the government side, as well as we do have access to users. So how to really take a few issues. Uh, two, one, two, I can. Another two, the respective governments, how to really put it across. So this is uh, going to be you know, a few of the ch uh, challenges which I thought I'll be focused and doing that. And, and, and I'm sure that uh, I means I'll try to get inputs as much as possible. And I do have access through my websites. And we run courses. So I'll be able to send this message across to get a proper feedback and to come down to this. So with these few words, uh, I leave the you know, flow back to Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiva. And uh, to let our next speaker, um, I'm delighted to, to have Shiva on board for two reasons here today. Um, Shiva Masasama is a person who holds the post of Chairman ANU, which happens to be our newest at large structure. But he comes with a different perspective uh, to have with people to India. Um, and that is from a group of people who have enough experience in a multi state
particular focus that is set on wider interests, in other words, that uh, uh, internet society chapter brings in to a very narrow part of naming the number of people who are members of the internet, what they can do in terms of policy. Uh, when we all began this adventure, it would probably seem that all those competitive interests between us and our uh, peers was going to be largely as that case now. Do you want to give it to Martin? Yes. Uh, thank you, Cyril, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Cyril, you might call it um, uh, and uh, um, ISOC as an organization is quite concerned about uh, the multi-stakeholderism in ICANN. So by being part of at-large, by being an at-large structure, we do the same work that uh, we are doing at ISOC. And uh, I'm, uh, for a brief introduction, I'm Shiva from uh, ISOC India, Chennai. And uh, I'll briefly go over uh, a general presentation. Next slide. It's next slide. Yes, and um, well, to a question of what is internet, the logical answer can only be um, wires and cables connected to motherboards. And uh, is it uh, what internet is all about? Or uh, is, there, is the more appropriate question, uh, who is the internet? Uh, internet, uh, that would be the more appropriate question. And uh, the answer is, internet is 1.3 billion people. It, it's people, it's not wires and cables, and so that makes a lot of difference in understanding internet, and uh, uh, it is actually the users that uh, make uh, internet. So when we, if we look at uh, the evolution of internet, it started as a, an academic exercise with uh, participation from uh, the defense department. And uh, it, in, the, in the beginning, in the 70s, it was a very closely knit academic network. And then it uh, moved on to become a proprietary network with uh, companies like CompuServe and um, AOL uh, taking a major share in how the internet is run, how the internet service is provided on proprietary models. Then during the last 10 years, it evolved, rapidly evolved into what it is today. And it's huge. It has become huge. It has become an uh, internet of 1.3 billion people only because it is the users who contributed to the evolution of the internet. And uh, it is the users who make up the internet. And um, the internet uh, has an end-to-end model. And it is user-centric. And this is what needs to be preserved. ISOC's major mission is to preserve the user-centric end-to-end model of the internet. And next. Um, in the process of preserving the user centricity, it is important to pay attention to the multi-stakeholder model, which is, uh, which is here to stay now. Uh, it's not uh, only in ISOC, it, uh, um, in OECD, in, uh, in the UN, and uh, uh, even in ITU, the multi-stakeholder uh, approach is increasingly being adopted. And what at large does is be the user's voice in the ICANN process. So at large uh, has grown to be a body with 100 at large structures. What is special about at large is that uh, it is divided into five regional at large organizations and uh, each RALO is geographically balanced. It represents uh, all geographic regions. So through these 100 uh, at-large structures, 
more to come, spread over five regions. It generates users' inputs to facilitate uh, the decision-making process in ICANN. So ICANN is in need of uh, user inputs to make the right decisions. And at large has been doing this. And uh, some of the work that at large has done during the last few years is uh, it has helped fast track the CCTLD process. It has uh, played a very significant role in uh, the introduction of IDNs, and it's doing its work on IPv4 to IPv6 transition among quite a lot of work that uh, it is doing. And uh, there are some challenges in the process of uh, further evolution of at large. One, uh, we need to be better represented in ICANN board so that uh, the user's voice is uh, representatively heard. It's, uh, and uh, then internally, we'll, we keep working on reaching out better with other organizations, with users, to, make, uh, to bring in more and more at large structures. So at large, the mission of at large is to be the user's voice in a part of the internet process. And I'm very happy to be a part of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Harry Hare from uh, African E-Development Resource Center based in Kenya. Uh, my, my question is, how does uh, uh, ICANN, uh, through the ALAC, aggregate issues uh, from the grassroots uh, to be discussed as policy issues uh, within ICANN? Because I, uh, I don't see participation uh, by people uh, at the grassroots in, uh, in, in, the, in the named ALAC structures.
consumer protection, um, and that was called domain tasting. And so whilst it wasn't on the ICANN agenda as an issue, it became an ICANN matter to be dealt with post-haste, because the at-large advisory committee, based on concerns and information from the ALSs, the grassroots membership, um, this ranged from the Consumers Union in the uh, North American Regional at-large organisation, um, to the New Zealand uh, membership in Asia Pacific and uh, also the, uh, the Japanese um, members. We unified our voice on concern and then ICANN, the larger entity, works with each of its support organisations and advisory committees to find the best way forward. In this case, the response to controlling um, what is called the main tasting happened in a number of layers. There was a GNSO structural approach, there was a financial structural approach to control it by changing uh, costs, which was an ICANN board um, matter, and there is the education and outreach role, which comes back to our regional large organisations, where they are involving the grassroots members. So let me use an example of the Internet Society of Australia, um, which has a role to educate and outreach telecommunication consumers within country. We get grant fund money from the Department of Broadband and uh, Economic uh, Development to, to do that each year. We were able to invite key leaders in consumer groups within country to briefings that were provided in simple language using telephone bridges by ICANN to bring themselves up to speed on this matter, to form opinion from grassroots, and then to say, in the case of Australia, the internet using public and consumers in general are concerned about this matter because of da, da, da. So that's, that's a perfect example of how real grassroots influence comes into a measurable outcome. Do you have a follow-up question to that? Uh, my, my question was actually based on... Strategic plan 
but most importantly, not just to get orientated and up to speed so that they feel comfortable and empowered putting in their opinions when we ask for them. What we're doing is forming inter and intra networks between these avalanche structures. And when you've got an active, viable, very uh, verbal and very experienced chapter in an at-large structure that is interacting both within country, nationally and internationally on policy development to match up with a chapter that is coming from a least developed economy or emerging economy will be a mentoring system that in my opinion will be worth its weight in gold and an excellent usage of what we do keep having to remind everybody is registrant derived funds in the first place. And how is that for For more information, we have a website, www.afra.org, and we have a, a list of discussions, African, uh, African ICAN and uh, African discuss, where, where we have more information and discussion issues. You can join the link. And, and what's most important is it's done in both uh, French and English, so it, it's, it's a dual, which makes it much easier. The same as the Latin American and Caribbean um, activities are done in predominantly Spanish, and we manage with what in, whatever English translations we, we can get. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, go ahead. Canada, from the um, CCLD operator in Canada. And uh, we have a member driven bottom up multi-stakeholder environment in our uh, in our country. And uh, if I looked into you know, the number of folks here in the audience, I would say our challenge is very similar. It's how do you actually get, so the rubber hits the road, how do you actually get membership, however you define it, to come out and participate in what can be somewhat esoteric discussions, but discussions that are nonetheless extremely relevant to the average person, certainly the Canadian landscape, we have uh, near 100% uh, internet connectivity in the home, uh, very high level of broadband access. We're very fortunate that way. So in a certain sense, it's like power. Everybody has it, everybody needs it, but nobody really cares to discuss it until perhaps there's a very big issue. In the interim, how do you get membership or individuals to actually come out and participate in what are very real and important issues on internet governance? Uh, broadly, broadly defined, and how do how do, how do you guys get out and do it? And probably from my perspective, can I leverage the North American chapter to come out and drive participation in our conversations? Absolutely, see as a group of grassroots individuals in ground in many countries who've identified themselves as interested in being involved in policy development within the narrow <coughs> remit of what I can does as perfect opportunities for those same groups to be accessed within countries locally and regionally for the wider consumer issues that they have. Because we don't talk about spam, we don't talk about all sorts of things that are very important to the user groups we have within the, the construct of, of our naming and numbering policy work within ICANN. It is the same people who should be working hand in glove with the CCTLD in their own region. And of course in some countries that is a very much how they have come to be at large structures within ICANN. The, coming back to the example from my own at large structure, the CCTLD AUDA operates in an absolute mandate of balance in its policy development and in its governance between supply and demand. And it was our ongoing and very engaged um, activities within our country code environment on policy development that led us as an ISOC chapter to say, hey, we should be doing this in the GTLD space as well and to become an at-large structure. But what you're asking also means we need to get people continually interested in topics which are highly technical and pretty esoteric. So what we're doing in terms of transition, for example, between IP is we're engaging with the architects board. We're engaging with the disability access people. 
We're engaging with the um, Chambers of Commerce interested in specific export environments within the Pacific Area Rim. And we're asking them, do they want to have continued access um, to a client base that happens to be V6 exclusive? And if they do, they probably need to give us some feedback on the next survey about what they feel about secondary markets or whatever we're discussing with V4 and V6 transition. So it's a matter of making it palatable, making it interesting. And when you say to an architecture board um, and, and the lobbyists that, that they have in government, well, you know, do you want your marketing career in, um, in Japan to be able to see your website? The answer is yes. And all of a sudden they realise why they do need to be interested and respond to surveys. It's like any other marketing exercise. It's keeping it simple, keeping it accurate, keeping it fresh and not asking too much. Small bite-sized pieces is how we've approached it. And we, from an at-large advisory committee perspective, are running monthly briefings on topics which are open to absolutely anybody, not just our at-large structures, but we're finding other parts of ICANN, other members of support organisations or advisory committees are dialing in to listen to a discussion and an expert discussion talking about particular technical issues. Um, once people are comfortable with the issues and the language, you can usually then get them to respond quite promptly when you want an opinion piece. And that's the, that's the tricky part.